tell you what it was like, what happened, and what I'm like now, right? Um, it was never my dream to be an alcoholic. Like, I didn't grow up hoping one day that I could admit that I was powerless over, over anything. And uh, it is the strongest thing I have today, right? Um, I didn't grow up in a home with any abuse or anything like that. Um, I grew up in an amazing home. Uh, I grew up in a single family home. My father, who was my best friend and my hero. I talked to him probably every single day, right? Um, uh, my sister is currently serving five years in the Texas Department of Corrections and she suffers from the same disease as me. I have two half brothers um, that both suffer from the same disease as me and a mother as well. Um, I haven't seen my mother. I saw my mother once from the age of about three to 16. Um, and uh, she contacted me about six months ago and uh, she just told me that uh, she wanted to see the kind of man I'd become. And if it wasn't for the, uh, the things I'd learned in Alcoholics Anonymous, the conversation would have been much more different, right? But instead I just introduced myself like I was talking to a stranger. She told her who my wife and kids were and that I was doing really well. Uh, she contacted me a little bit later and she told me she had two weeks of sobriety. So shout out to mom, right? Um, I don't know if she's still sober. Every once in a while, she'll post a picture with a, a smoky, like, filter, and I'm like, mm, you know? <laughs> Maybe she went back out, I'm not sure, but that's kind of a tall tale sign right there. When you start getting filter pictures with demons in the background, you're like, all right, <laughs> you know? Um, but with that being said, like I said, my father is a, my hero, and my dad's that kind of man that believes that his children, they can move mountains, and they could accomplish absolutely everything. Like, my dad is my guy. Uh, my dad never missed a football game, a football practice, ski race, wrestling, tournament, basketball game, you name it, my dad was there every single way, the whole time, you know? I did have some other great influences in, in my life. My, my gorgeous aunt was there the whole time. She's came out here from Salt Lake City to hear me speak. And uh, my beautiful grandmother and grandfather, right? Um, now these two people, like they were the most important people outside my father in my life. Like if God sent angels on earth, like this was my grandparents, right? Like unconditional love, um, just the most amazing people you can have in your life, you know? Uh, my father was a single father, so he just dropped me off at grandma's house every single day. She'd have a lunch ready for me, help me do my homework, and then send me off to school, right? And I'd walk back to grandma's house after school. And I, I'm telling you, like, my childhood was amazing. Um, I cannot sit here and tell you I'm a victim of absolutely anything because I had every advantage that, I, that, that a kid could want. And I still um, ended up uh, an alcoholic and an addict, right? Um, so that was my childhood. Now, I don't know when I, when I crossed over to being an alcoholic, you know? But after reading the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, I suffered from a lot of the things that they describe in the big book from a little kid before I even had the chance to drink any alcohol. Um, I remember being absolutely terrified that the kids in my neighborhood or, or, or my friends, they wouldn't, they wouldn't accept me or wouldn't like me for, for who I was. You know, and I remember just being absolutely paralyzed with fear that they, that they wouldn't accept me. So I remember I would always ask a lot of questions and whatever I thought they wanted me to be, that's kind of what I became, right? I had a lot of different masks I put on depending on who I was hanging out with. Um, I was a pretty good kid. I never really got in a lot of trouble until I was about 12 or 13. Um, and still suffering with all this different kind of fear, I remember I would use sports as kind of my way out, right? Like I, I'd score a touchdown and people would clap and I'd be okay with myself. For, for a minute, you know? And then after the game, I'd go back to being full of fear, you know? And then one, one day when I was, I think, 13 or 14, that all changed, and that was the first day I ever tried alcohol. And all of a sudden, every single fear and every single inadequacy that I had was gone, right? I no longer cared what you thought about me because I knew who I was and I knew that I was amazing and I didn't care what anybody think, and it really worked for me, right? They talk about it being kind of a spiritual experience. Well, that's what I had. That was my solution, and I held on to it for dear life. Um, I'm not that kind of person that can, um, they can run around and get loaded and not get in any trouble, you know? <laughs> I'm a loud guy, and, and I'm very obnoxious, and I run around, and I cause a lot of havoc, right? Um, so my drinking career and my drug career were in really, uh, were in spurts, right? So I remember the first time I got in trouble, I was 15 years old. We would just go around and we'd break into cars and I went to Genesis for my first time at the age of 15 years old, right? Genesis, Genesis is uh, kind of like a child work prison camp where you go work off restitution, you know? 
And it was really funny. I mentioned this because it was the first time I ever started making these promises to my family and my friends uh, that I meant dearly, right? Like I truly believed these things I was saying. And I remember talking to my father on the phone saying, Dad, please don't, please don't give up on me. Like, I'm going to get this together. I promise you I won't drink. I won't get in any more fights. I won't get in any more trouble. Just please don't give up on me. Like, I can do this. Um, I said the same thing to my grandparents, and I truly meant it. Um, I remember my first day out of Genesis, uh, my best friend Simon drove by, and uh, he saw my light on in my room and started throwing rocks at my room, right? So I opened the window, and he's like, sneak out, sneak out. I'm like, I'm not coming out, dog. And he said, don't be a little beep about it, you know? I'm going to try not to swear too much. Well, I can't handle that, right? I'm so full of fear at this point. What, what is he going to think of me? Is he going to think I'm lame? Is he going to think I'm weak? I can't handle that, right? So, of course, I sneak out. My first day after making all these promises to my family and friends, I get loaded on the first night out, right? Needless to say, I don't make it very long. I continue to go in and out of juvenile detention facilities, um, stealing from family, stealing from friends, and, and really not living up to the potential that I have, right? Um, at this point in time, I'm not sure exactly when my family started giving up on me, but I'm sure it wasn't too far after this, right? Um, at the age of 19 is when I went to prison for my very first time. Um, I, got in a, I got charged with aggravated assault and aggravated robbery after a fist fight at a house party. And in my mind, everybody's seeing all this stuff going on around me, like, RJ, you're messing up. RJ, get your stuff together, you know? But in my mind, it's like, why are you tripping? Like, what are you talking about? I got this. It's, it's no big deal. Um, it was a big deal. I remember the, the judge uh, said, RJ, we're sentencing you to Utah State Penitentiary for zero to five years, right? Um, I looked back at my father, and just like every football game and basketball game, my father was there in my court case. I looked back, and it was the one and only time I ever seen my father cry, right? Uh, this son that he raised that, uh, to move mountains, and all of a sudden he's getting shackled and handcuffed and sent to prison where he's not going to be able to help me at all, you know? Um, at this point in my recovery, I can honestly sit here and tell you guys that uh, I can be honest about the feelings I had at that point in time in my life, and it was absolute terror, right? I was scared for my life. I remember being on this prison bus and looking around at these guys I'm on the bus with, and they got tattoos all over their faces, and they're grown men, and they're convicts, and I just remember being absolutely terrified um, and thinking just, what, what am I going to do, right? So I did what I always do, and I just became what I thought they wanted me to be, you know? I won't get into too much stuff into that. Um, I did four and a half years, right? I got locked up, I was 19. Uh, I did about four and a half years and I started making those same exact promises uh, to my family that I did when I got out of Genesis. I remember talking to my grandma and I was like, grandma, if, if I just had what my dad had grown up, if I had you and grandpa and I had that house that he lived in and I had your support and I just know I could do it, you know? Um, so my grandmother let me parole to her house, right? I loved it. My grandma's got a really nice house, you know? <laughs> you know? Um, my first night out, that same friend came by my house, and he brought me a cell phone and some money and some clothes. And I'm just straight out of prison. I'm like, all right, this is cool. And they're like, we're going out. And I'm like, I'm on curfew. They're like, don't be a bitch about it. So just like I did before, I snuck out of my gorgeous grandmother's house at about 11 o'clock at night. And I came home and I had throw up all over me and I didn't have a shirt on anymore and I had no shoe on, right? And uh, I came home and my grandmother was sitting on the porch and she was crying. And uh, again, that should be enough, right? This is like the most important woman in my life. And my reaction was, why are you tripping? I just went out with my friends, it's okay, you know? But I remember just seeing my grandmother on the porch just crying and I just remember, now, now I look back and it just breaks my heart, you know? Um, one of her neighbors had called her and said, someone's sneaking out of your house right now, you know? That's, uh, that's one of those nice east side neighborhoods, you know, <laughs> with those neighborhood watches, right? So that, that should have been enough for me, but of course that's not enough for me. Um, I made it six weeks, uh, so I was out of prison for, I went to prison for four and a half years, I was out for about six weeks, and uh, I made the five o'clock news, and I went right back to jail. And I remember not wanting to call my dad because we share the same name. And, and when the five o'clock news is like, Richard Mackey, $10,000 drug bust. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So that wasn't one of the biggest highlights of my life, but I have been on the news, you know? So um, that's what I'm really trying to do here is I'm trying to paint a, a picture of the unmanageability in my life that everybody saw except for me, you know? Um, I ended up doing five and a half more years in that, that time, right? So 
I mean, if you put it all together from the age of 19, I got out of prison when I was 30 years old, right? Um, one amazing thing happened to me when I was in prison right there, and it's a pretty important part of my life because I made a phone call to my sister, and one of her friends answered the phone and started making fun of me. And she was like, how's Bubba treating you in there and all that stuff, you know? And so I hung up the phone on her, and little did I know I'd end up marrying that girl, you know? <laughs> That's my beautiful wife, Gypsy, and I love her very much. Shout out to my wife. Um, she's been there the whole time. So um, I started making the promises I'd made to my grandparents and my dad. I started making them to this new woman in my life, right? I'm like, oh, shoot, I want to get out. I want to get a job, and I want to take care of you. She's like, but I got a son. I'm like, Shh, I'm trying to be a dad, you know, <laughs> telling her all those things, you know. But the funny thing is I meant it with all of my heart, and, and I got out, and now I had something to, something to fight for. This is, I've never had any, any other responsibilities in my life other than for me to not die, you know? Which was hard, because a lot of times my dad would walk in the room when I was a kid and he'd hit my foot on his way to work and I'd wake up and I'd be like, what are you doing? He said, uh, just making sure you're still breathing, you know? So there's a lot of times he wasn't sure I was even handling that part of my life, right? Um, but I got out of work and I remember um, I got out of prison on Tuesday, shout out to Tuesdays, <laughs> yep. Um, and I immediately got a job. Uh, I got a job by Thursday. I was digging ditches on the side of a road um, doing underground installation, right? I like to say that I was digging ditches with a, with a, with a rusty shovel that didn't dig very well, but uh, they were pretty nice shovels, you know? So at that point in my life, I really wanted to do something different and I busted my butt and I stayed sober. But at this point in my life, I had no idea what an alcoholic is or an addict and I don't know what an AA is. I, I haven't been exposed to any of this kind of stuff, you know? Um, so I started digging ditches on the side of the road for 12 bucks an hour. Within six months, I got my Class A CDL tanker endorsements, and I'm foreman of an underground installation company with a company truck and a company credit card. You know, wow. kicking ass, right? Um, and in my mind, I'm doing great. But uh, what I believe now that I didn't know then is, alcoholic, is alcoholism is a progressive disease, right? If you leave this untreated, it's going to get worse, never better. And without my having any understanding of any of this stuff, I went to a University of Utah football game with my pops. Um, I can't tell you anything about that game. I can tell you we played the Oregon Ducks, and that's about it, right? Because before the game, we went out to eat, and I had two beers at a bar named X, downtown Salt Lake City, right? Um, the entire game, I couldn't think about anything except getting loaded, right? And now I know there's this, there's this uh, uh, physical allergy and a mental obsession, you know? This is... This is real, right? If you put any substance into my body, I can promise you one thing, I don't know where I'm gonna be, right? And so that entire game, all I thought about was getting loaded. And I did the old high school walk around trip. My dad dropped me off in my house and I, I pretended to go in the door and I went around back until he left and I jumped in my truck and I went and got loaded for two and a half, three days, right? Um, I remember because this is the most paralyzed by fear and guilt and shame that I've ever been in my life. I don't know if anybody can relate to this, but I'm loaded and my wife, who is now pregnant, because I did exactly what you're supposed to be, do when you get out of prison and you immediately get your girl pregnant, right? <laughs> so now my pregnant girl's calling me and calling me and calling me and calling me and I'm looking at the phone ring and I physically cannot bring myself to answer this phone. I'm seriously paralyzed by shame and guilt and fear, right? Like to the point where I just sat in my car and, and cried and wanted to kill myself all night, right? Um, I came home on Sunday and I went to, into manipulation mode because that's what we do, right? Um, I started crying and told her, please don't, please don't worry. Don't tell anybody. I got this. I relapsed, but don't worry. I got it under control, you know? Little did I know she called every single person that she knew I knew. And uh, Monday morning, my, my boss is at my house before I got to leave for work and he fired me took my company truck, my company credit card, right? So that's the kind of addiction, that's the kind of alcoholism I'm dealing with, right? Like they always talk about your alcoholism's in the parking lot doing push-ups. Mine was, you know? Uh, two and a half days of drinking and drugging and I lost everything, right? So I remember that first time I ever went to a treatment center was uh, uh, the VOA. <laughs> All you guys that are laughing are sick because you guys know about the VOA. <laughs> All these guys at Ardu, shout out Ardu, you guys got it good right now. Don't want to mess that up, you know? Well, I got this thing and it's called ego. And it makes me believe that I, think, that I think I'm better than you, you know? And I think I'm better than the situation that you're in, even though I'm in the exact same situation. In my mind, I'm doing big things. I had a truck. I'm living in a fourplex with my pregnant girlfriend, you know? Like, I'm doing big things, you know? 
Um, so my ego didn't want me to stay at this place because it was dirty and grimy and I thought I was better than everybody. So I kind of pushed an issue and I got kicked out of it for slapping someone during snack time. <laughs> right? And, and perfect excuse because I can use this as a manipulation tactic. That's what I do. I manipulate everything and everybody. Right? I tell my wife I want to stay, but they won't let me. But don't trip. I got a nap and a sandwich. I'm feeling good. You know? Uh, the next year of my life was absolute chaos. Um, I had a lot of things happen, and I, I and there are things I truly regret today. Um, my my beautiful grandmother. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever had anybody p pass away from dementia, right? Um, it is extremely sad. You watch the person forget everything that they know and love. You know, um, it is very sad. My grandmother woke up a week before my son was supposed to be born, and she fell down the stairs and she broke her back. You know. So I got to spend the night in the, in the hospital with her, and it, it was one of my favorite experiences. I love my grandmother so much. Well, the next morning, uh, she came home to hospice care, and she passed away in her own home, right? Um, and I don't know how to act, right? Up until this point, like, feelings are something that are just for women, right? Like, let's not get too serious, guys, right? Um, so I didn't try to grieve my grandma. I didn't even attempt to. But what I, what I tried to do was just get so loaded that I wouldn't even know what's going on. You know, and I did. Um, I went to my grandma, my beautiful grandmother, my favorite person in the world's funeral, loaded. Um, I carried her to her final resting place, loaded. You know, a week later or three days later, my son was born and I cut his umbilical cord loaded. Right. I was so loaded that the, the, the doctor kicked me out of the hospital for like six hours. My wife was in surgery, was in uh, labor for 21 hours and I had to sit in the parking lot for like eight hours before they let me come back in because I was so out of my mind. So I ended up uh, cutting my son's umbilical cord for the first time loaded. And uh, I remember everybody, be, I heard stories about like having your child and be like, it looks like Mufasa, like they hold it up and the, the clouds separate and the light comes through and shines on your baby, you know? I didn't have that. What I had was a lot of shame and guilt. And, 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 and I had an understanding that I was a failure as not only a husband, but as a father. You know, I knew without a doubt that my family and my wife and especially my new son were better off without me. You know, that's 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 what was in my heart at the time I cut my son's umbilical cord. You know, a month later, my son had to have surgery on his little head. Um, his little soft spot started fusing too soon. So he had to have surgery and they removed two inches of skull off the top of my two month old son's head. Right. Um, I went I went there loaded. Right. Because I don't know if you're like me, but. I heard Adam T say, uh, once you start drinking and drugging, it's like having sex with a gorilla. It's not over till the gorilla says it's over, you know? <laughs> and uh, the gorilla wasn't done with me, you know? The gorilla wasn't done. So I remember the most disgusting, <laughs> I remember the most disgusting I ever felt was when my son came out of surgery. Um, he came out of surgery and he fell asleep. And my wife was crying. I was holding my wife and she was crying. And she's like, I need to go out to the car. And she reached in my pocket and I had a pocket full of outside issues in my pocket. Right? And I remember she pulled her hand out and looked at me like she just wanted nothing to do with me. Like, you were so disgusting. Get away from me, you know? And that still wasn't enough, you know? Um, I'm going to hurry up. So the next about year of my life, um, I had a lot of uh, uh, Groundhog Day type issues, right? Um, my, gra my grandfather passed away just before Christmas after my grandmother passed away. Um, that was one of the, honestly, one of the best experiences of my life. Um, he pulled my aunt and my, my, my dad and my other aunt into the house and said he decided to stop doing dialysis. I believe he still holds a record for dialysis in Salt Lake. He's been on dialysis for about 20 years and he made a pledge to make sure that he was there until my grandma went away, right? Um, and right after he told him he was done with dialysis, he took a, a few more hours, took a breath and he passed away in his house too. Right. Um, just like my grandmother's funeral, I went there loaded. Um, I drove, I was a pallbearer, just the same as my grandmother. And I carried him to his final resting place with my grandmother loaded. Right. Pretty shitty. You know, uh, that's the kind of guy I am when I'm loaded. You know, um, at this point in my, at this point in my life, I can no longer look at myself in the mirror. I remember I would shave my face and I would just look down because I couldn't make eye contact with myself because I knew that I was, I was just, I wasn't worth it. You know, and it's a pretty sad day when uh, you can't look at yourself anymore. You know, 
Um, but then something happened, right? Um, I, I was sitting in my car crying by myself, wanting to die like normal. And my wife answered the phone. <laughs> You're sick if you think it's funny, because it's funny. It's funny because we've been there. I'm just sitting there crying by myself, you know? And she finally calls, and I, I look at it, and I answer, and I'm crying. I say, I just want some help. And at this point in my life, my wife couldn't trust me to pay the bills. So she, had, she now has a job, and she has insurance and stuff. And uh, she called the treatment center, and she got me into treatment, right? This is August 2021. Um, I went to treatment and uh, I think I had my first spiritual awakening that I chose to ignore. Um, that's always a good thing when you ignore God. But we went to an AA meeting my first day in treatment and we watched the Brandon Novak video on YouTube. I don't know if anybody's ever seen that. But just like Bob, ju just like uh, in Bill's story when he thought that he could, he now learned enough about his alcoholism that he, can, he could beat it. I watched that video and I heard this man speak about alcoholism and addiction in a way that I'd never heard anybody talk about it. And what he explained was exactly what I was suffering from. And I had this epiphany. Now I know what I'm up against. I don't need rehab. I could go home and do this myself now because I know what I'm up against. So I jump in my car and I go to leave and I have a flat tire. And at this point, I jump out and I go to look at the flat tire. I go to change my tire and all the, all the mentors at the treatment centers have come out. And uh, they're like, RJ, it's a sign from God. Come back in. <laughs> I'm like, no, it's not. You're tripping. It's just a flat tire. So I start jacking my truck. I uh, ja start jacking my car up to take the tire off and I don't have a lug nut lock key. So I can't get my tire off. So what do I do? I throw it all in there and I drive down the canyon on a flat tire. Because in my mind, I seriously believe this. This is alcoholism. This is cunning, baffling, and powerful. In my mind, I just needed to show my wife this video so she knew what I was up against so she would feel sorry enough for me not to leave me, you know? So I finally got to the bottom, put some flicks, some fix a flat in my tire, and on my way home, I never make it. I go right to the block, and I get loaded for another day. How did I get here? Why, 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 am, I, why am I here right now not at home with my wife and kids, Right? Um, I got back into treatment and I completely did all of the stuff they wanted me to do. You know, I went to therapy. I cried about my mommy issues, right? Um, I grieved my grandparents. I told them everything I possibly could and I worked the program like a freaking all-star. I'm that guy in process group like, hey, I know what's wrong with you. Listen to me. <laughs> you guys know that guy in treatment? That was me. That was me. <laughs> the therapist was like, RJ's getting it. And uh, so I did the, the, the thing that made the most sense to me, and, uh, and uh, I did a geological location change because West Valley, Salt Lake, that's my problem, you know? If only I could be in a different area where there is no drugs, like Utah County. <laughs> so I moved my family to Spanish Fork, Utah, right? No one knows what Spanish Fork, Utah is. My first day out of sober living, I go to work, and in the middle of my in the middle of my workday, I leave and go get loaded. It was a Friday. My wife started calling me, and just like that first time at my house, I looked at the phone, I threw it on the floor, and I ignored my wife. What the hell? I just did 90 days of treatment. I did sober living. I cried in therapy. If you believe the big book, nothing outside of God and a spiritual awakening is going to help you with relieve your alcoholism. I believe if my therapist had the ability to give me a pill and it would fix me, I think that they would have done that. Unfortunately for me, I'm a real alcoholic, right? Nothing outside of a spiritual awakening is going to fix me. So I checked myself into detox um, the first week of November 2021. I got out of treatment and I met this guy right here. Or I got out of detox and I went to a meeting at the palace. I raised my hand, I said, something like Kirk said, I, the way I remember it was like, I, I think I have a sponsor, I'm not sure, I wanna work the steps, I just don't wanna be a drug addict or an alcoholic anymore, I just want help. And uh, there was three people in that room, those three people are still in the rooms today, you know? Um, I got a sponsor that same night, and we immediately started working the steps. I remember I did my first three steps in the parking lot of the palace. He said, RJ breaks down like this, the first three, three steps are H-O-W, honest, open, and willingness. A willingness to, uh, so honesty, that, that your life's unmanageable with or without alcohol, right? And so I started thinking, I'm like, well, if you take alcohol and drugs away from me, my life's manageable. And I started thinking, no, it's not, right? 
Every single time I tried to get sober by myself, I'd make it two, two weeks maybe, and I would feel so uncomfortable in my own skin that I had to get loaded, you know? So my life's unmanageable with or without it, you know? I needed to be open-minded that there was something out there that was a power greater than myself that could relieve, relieve, relieve the alcoholism and restore me back to sanity, you know? Um, that was easy for me. Now, they always tell you to come up with a list of like what you want, what, what, what attributes your higher power had when you were growing up and, and what the higher power you have, you want to have now has, you know? And for me, it was pretty identical, you know? Like I grew up, my, my, my grandparents were extremely LDS. Um, I've never had a bad experience um, with, with, that, with that prominent religion out here. Um, they showed me nothing but unconditional love and same with everybody in their ward. Like they always wanted the best for me, you know? So the attributes of the God that I grew up with and the one I wanted were pretty identical. Um, the only thing I put in there was a sense of humor, you know? I'm like, this dude up there's gotta be funny watching this, you know, watching this train wreck. So that, that, was, that was easy for me too. I came in really broken. I knew I was a failure in every aspect of my life, like I said, and I just knew I needed something different. I was willing to do absolutely anything that anybody told me if it meant that I could get sober. The last thing he told me is I need to be willing to make a decision to turn my life over to that, that higher power, which I choose to call God, right? And, and, and in the parking lot of the palace that day, I decided to do so. Um, we immediately got into the fourth step because I don't know if you've ever read the big book, but it says I launched into a course of vigorous action. He asked me, he said, RJ, what does launched onto a course of vigorous action mean to, you, mean to you? What do you imagine? I said, I imagine a rocket ship. He's like a rocket ship slow. I said, no, they're not. So I, uh, he said, do this four step as honestly and as quickly as you can. I uh, immediately got into my four step and I did as thorough of a job as I could without being scared that if I gave him everything, he would tell me that I was awful and to leave, right? So I go do my fifth step with him and I'm sharing all this stuff that I think is important. Stole from family, went to prison, victimized this, 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 this. And he's like, RJ, this is great stuff. And he's like, I'm gonna tell you a story. And he told me a story about the worst thing that he had ever done in his life, right? The thing that he thought was just despicable. And he said, now, RJ, I know you did some stuff that's not on this list, and I want you to tell me it right now. And I told him all the worst items I had in stock, right? I told him absolutely everything. And he got out of his work van, and he walked over to the front door and opened it, and I thought he was kicking me out of his van. <laughs> I was like, oh, my gosh, I knew I shouldn't have trusted him, <laughs> you know? And he opened his van, and he gave me a hug. And he held me, and he told me, he said, RJ, I love you. He said, I accept you, and I don't think any differently of you at all. I was like, Whew. And I swear, like, a literal weight came off my back. Like, like, imagine an iceberg just melting down to the size of an ice cube. This is what I experienced. This is what I like to call a God shot. This was a spiritual awakening for me. I knew at that moment, even though I was at the Walmart in Springville in a freaking dirty white work van, that I was going to be able to stay sober. I'd always watch Kirk, and... And I'd always listen to Kirk, and, uh, and I really wanted what Kirk had, so I started, I started just doing what Kirk did. Um, before I get to that, I kept working the steps, right? Even though I had a little bit of relief now. And for me, where I came from and, and how broken I was, a little bit of relief felt like I moved into a, from, went from homeless to living in a mansion, okay? I mean, in, in, internally, like, even though I just just had just like the, the smallest bit of relief. Like I felt like a king, like, I, I, like everything was just, I mean, t food tasted better, right? Colors were brighter, like everything was better in my life. And uh, we got in step six and seven and, and, and I'm glad that I got Kirk because now I've, I've actually learned about these character defects because I asked God to really take these defects away from me, right? And I learned in my sobriety, maybe uh, through reading that drop the rock in the 12 and 12 that, I might not have actually given up a lot of my character defects, more camouflaged them, right? But I'll, I'll get into that stuff. Uh, I got into step, step uh, ma making my amends and stuff like that, you know? And for me, the amends were actually pretty easy. All the people I called and made amends with um, were like, RJ, I just want you to be better, you know? Like, you don't owe me anything, just, just live, li live the life you're supposed to live, you know? Um, financial amends are still hard. Even though I'd filed bankruptcy before I got sober, Right? Um, I still had a lot of amends. And I remember I, I was actually working with Kirk 
and I got a paper that said they were going to start garnishing my wages, right? And all these times I'd been sent to prison, all I heard was, we're sent you to prison, but I didn't listen after that. But after that, they said other stuff, you know? They are like, and a $10,000 fine, you know? <laughs> and $5,000 in restitution. And $2,900 restitution. So I had all this restitution that I just never paid attention to because I'm like, when I get out of prison, you just got to wipe everything clean. That's not the case. <laughs> so that, that's my biggest financial amends I'm still making today. I pay, them, I pay them $300 a month. They get to keep all my state taxes for the next five years, you know? But I owe that money. That's wreckage of my past. Like, there's a lot of things that I've done. And honestly, if I got caught for everything I had done, uh, I got still be in prison today. You know, so if I have to pay him $20,000 in restitution, then so be it, right? Um, then I got into uh, what, what my sponsor calls the daily discipline, step 10, 11, and 12. I worked my steps, keeping this in mind, I worked my steps in two weeks, okay? Um, step 10, meditate and pray, right? Step, or step 10, take a daily inventory, and when we're wrong, promptly admit it. I got a little story about that real quick. I remember I was working and uh, went to a candy machine. This is going to sound dumb for everybody, but for me, this is a big deal. The candy got stuck. I don't play that. I bought that. That's my candy. <laughs> so I picked that thing up. And I rocked the sh I rocked the crap out of it. You know, about six other candy bars came through, and I'm like, "That's what you get." Shit, just gave me what I paid for. I grabbed all the candy bars. I ate every single one of them, and I started going back to work. And I had this feeling like, "Dude, that's just." Like, that's not what we're doing. Like, we gave, we gave it up to God. God's watching. That's my new employer. Like, you got to fix that. And I went back to the vending machine, and I paid for every single slot that all the candy bars came through, right? For me, that's a big deal, right? Nobody's watching, and I went back. Originally, I didn't do the right thing, you know? But I went back, and I made it right. Um, I was wrong, and I promptly admitted it, right? That was when I was about four or five months sober, and I was like, I am changing, you know? <laughs> and now I even take the carts and push them back inside at the grocery store, you know? I don't just throw them in the parking lot anymore. <laughs> Meditate and pray daily, right? This was hard for me. Um, I could barely cross my legs, let alone hold my hands out and meditate. I can't do this, right? This is hard for me. And praying was difficult for me too. Um, I felt myself feeling a little goofy praying out loud, I'll be honest with you guys, you know? Um, and meditating was really hard. But what I found I could do was I could sit down with myself and I could put a speaker tape on and I could talk to God every day, you know. The first year of my sobriety, I probably listened to two or three speaker tapes every single day. I still listen to them. I still listen to them. And as a matter of fact, the whole week leading up to this, I listened to nothing but speaker tapes and I tried to steal as many one-liners as I could. <laughs> and then I got up here and I forgot every single one of them, <laughs> except the gorilla thing, <laughs> you know. Um... But that is something that, uh, that was my New Year's resolution to make sure that I did my dailies every single day because I really slacked on that. And uh, since the beginning of the year, I've, I, I, I've, I've, uh, I've prayed and I've read out of the big book every single day. Um, and I do find that my days are just better. If I pray and I just ask for God for guidance and the knowledge of his will for me and the power to carry it out, like, I can't explain the, the psychic change that has come about after applying these steps in my life, you know? Um, step 12, after two weeks of being sober, maybe three weeks, uh, my sponsor and a couple of his friends would always go to do H&I, &I, right? And they were like, you're coming. And as much as I did not want to come, I want what these guys got, so I'm going to do what they do. And I remember walking into this treatment center, and uh, my best friend since day one, Morgan, he's sitting in there. And he's like, oh, RJ, come here, come here. Let's go tell the med techs that you're here and put you in my room, right? I'm like, I'm not here for rehab, dog. He's like, why are you here? I'm here to talk to you about Alcoholics Anonymous, right? He was on my amends list. I was able to make an amends with him after that meeting, and he asked me, he's like, help, help, help me get a sponsor, help me get sober. And I was able to introduce him to a sponsor that day. And uh, come to find out we have the same sobriety date, November 12, 2021, and we're both still sober today, you know? That was like the huge God shot in my life. Like at this moment, God put me exactly where I needed to be, and I was there. And that just changed my, that just absolutely changed my life, you know. Um, ever since then, I dove into service, you know. Um, step 12, they talk about step 12 being 90% of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, right. Um, I believe that. There's no better feeling I've ever gotten than, than going into a treatment center and then seeing them a, a, after at a meeting still sober, you know. Um, I, we started about, what, five 
treatment centers in that year, Kirk, something like that. Um, I took over the district chair for H&I. &I. I think when we started, we had like three or four. And uh, by the end of that year, I think we had eight treatment centers that we went into in the Utah County area, you know? Um, we went to a treatment center like four, three, four times a week, maybe more sometimes. Um, and it was the, just the absolute root of my, of my recovery was service. Um, today, my life is much different. Um, I've lived a lot in the last two plus years, right? Um, I remember I'd always hear all these old timers and talk about run, ride that pink cloud, you know, because life's going to happen. Well, I rode that pink cloud for two years, you know, um, every single day of my life was the best day of my life. You know, I had absolutely no problems. I got the best job I had ever had. I was working with Kirk. I was making the most money I ever made. I immediately went from that job to a new job. And I'm now a junior crew chief of Valley Land Surveying. Got that company truck back, got that company credit card back, right? And I'm making the most money I've ever made. And I've been living a life, right? Right after sobriety, I was able to take my, my family to Lake Tahoe, right, for Easter. I took them to uh, Disneyland. I know I'm still selfish because every time I do things like this with my kids, I'm like, I wish I just left them at home, you know? <laughs> but like, I'm able to actually live a life, you know? Um, I'm involved in everything, right? I do a lot of sober softball. I do all these kind of sober events. And I had this sponsee, he was 23 years old. This was in September this year. And I'm working the steps with him and he's absolutely killing it, you know? Um, he had a relapse on a, on a Saturday. Um, I went and saw him on Monday, and he took his own life on Tuesday, right? Um, I'd always heard, like, alcoholism, this is a fatal, a fatal malady, right? Left untreated equals fatal 100% of the time. I'd never experienced that. Like, I'd heard of people ODing, and I'd heard of people passing away, but this was right close to home, you know? Um, don't get it confused that uh, he took his life from alcoholism. I, he died from alcoholism. He's 23 years old. I went to visit him um, after he was pronounced brain dead and they were, and they carted him down the hospital and they did like all the hospital doctors and nurses lined the hallways up. And uh, it was really, really sad and really uh, special. But it really um, helped me in my recovery. And any chance I could get to talk about Tyler's story, like I'm always going to do that. You know, he was an amazing kid. And that, that's really like, if, you, if you're serious, uh, if you're a serious alcoholic like I am, like this is a seriously deadly thing. And if you don't, if you're one of those people that raised your hand and didn't have a sponsor, like this is life or death. I certainly hope you that you get one of the other people to raise their hand and said they're willing to sponsor because this is like this is God telling you right now, like this is your opportunity, right? Um, and but right after that, my life got just amazing again. You know, um, me and my wife found out we were pregnant. You know, and that was freaking so cool because I missed all of the first one, you know? Um, I remember going to that first ultrasound at 10 weeks and I'm like, yes. So I'm like, I'm going to name the baby this time. She's like, you named the last one. I'm like, <laughs> and I remember, I remember going through thousands and thousands and thousands of different combinations of names, you know? I was like, we can have twins, and we can name the first one William Henry after Billy the Kid, and the other one Jesse James. I was like, we could do this, right? I was so excited. Uh, we went in to find out the gender of our baby at 16 weeks, and we had our ultrasound, and we didn't have a heartbeat, and we lost our baby, you know? And uh, thank God for the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, is what I can say. I never had a desire to get loaded again. It never came up. It never, not one point in that whole situation was like, I need to go get loaded. The whole time I was like, this is my opportunity to be there for my wife. Like I was there, like, she's been there for me. Something like that could really put a lot of strain on a relationship. Um, God blessed me immediately that same day. And never in my life have I ever been closer to my wife. Never in my life have I ever been more grateful for the children I have. And never in my life have I ever been more grateful for my recovery and my sobriety. You know, I was there for my wife every single step of the way, and it helped me get um, more right with God. Because if you're like me, I'm like, God, help me with my sobriety, right? You can see what I could do at work. I can make things happen. You can see how I could be a good husband and a dad. Like, just help me stay sober, and I got the rest of this stuff. 
that helped me realize I don't have the rest of this stuff and I need God in every, absolutely every aspect of my life. And I surrendered that day to, to God and I, I asked him and welcomed him into, him into my life in every aspect, you know. Since then, um, it has just, it has been just the best day of my life ever and ever again, you know. I'm on that pink cloud still to this day. You know, like God has taken like a really selfish convict, like manipulating alcoholic, drug addict, like anything you can absolutely label me, that's me. And he's turned me into a servant, you know. Um, I've never done any substance at all that, that has ever made me feel even close to the feeling I have every day when I wake up, you know. Um, today, I get to look myself in the eyes and I'm super happy and proud of the man I see in the mirror, you know. Um, and it's funny because it's like I haven't done anything, right? And none of the stuff that I have is even mine. Um, I, all I did was I took suggestions, you know. I, I, I took those suggestions and I put some action towards them. And uh, everything else is history, you know. God's going to do for you what you can't do for yourself, but he's not going to do for you what you can do, you know. Like, you have to put some effort forward. I remember uh, some of the things that helped me get through the steps and, like, some of these little... Uh, like metaphors. I remember when I was doing my step four, I heard this thing about uh, why step four is the most important step there is, you know. And I don't know if it's the most important because you're not going to do a step four without a step three or two or one or whatever, but who likes cheesecake? You guys like cheesecake? I like cheesecake too. Well, this is kind of like step four that I heard that I really liked. It was like if you put that cheesecake in a backpack and you leave it for a week, it's going to start growing mold on it, right? If you leave that cheesecake in that backpack for a year, it's no longer going to be che cheesecake, right? If you take a bite of that shit, it's going to kill you, right? That's kind of like what these secrets are that we're keeping inside of us, right? Like, they're not going anywhere. You stuff them deep inside of you, and you're like, all right, nobody can see them. They're going to go away, but they don't, they don't go away. They change into something completely different, you know? That's why I think it is so important to be honest in this whole program and to uh, really... Uh, Really trust in God and really trust in your sponsor because the moment you get rid of all that crap, like your life's going to completely change, you know? Um, yeah, I guess I'm a little early. I don't really know what else to talk about. But um, I'm just super grateful for all of you guys to come here today. And uh, if you guys need anything, like my door is always open. If you need a sponsor, I'm sponsoring. If, if not, tons of these other people are. And uh, with that, I'll go ahead and take another 24. Thank you.